And as I walk in, he takes a bite of it and the whole back end of it just explodes all over him. Thank you so much, guys, for being here today talking about the Joe Kubert School. So all three of you went to the school at different times. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, I think like 10 years apart each. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So who was the first one to attend? Me. Ron, what was it yeah. like when you attended? When I attended, the, the shorthand I have for it is, um, it was like the old movie Animal House, except it was full of nerd cartoonists instead of normal nerd weird geek people. Uh, <laughs> because the school back then was, the, the school was, was this old mansion in the middle of Dover, New Jersey. They just bought the mansion and converted that into the school. Three stories and... Uh, just full of young, mostly men. There were a few women, but it's mostly young men, either fresh out of high school or maybe they had a little bit of work or college experience in them, but just crazed because they were suddenly, we were all suddenly surrounded by other people just like us, uh, as opposed to having come from largely closeted existences as like the only kid in high school that liked comic books or drew or whatever. And all of a sudden we were just, immersed in this world full of people just like us. The school had just started. I was in the second, the second year. So they were still trying to figure out how to be a school. The, the instructors were people that had 10, 20, 30 years of professional experience as graphic artists, cartoonists, commercial artists, but they didn't formalize teaching lesson plans and, and uh, how to present a, a lecture down very well. But again, that really fit that sort of animal health sort of feeling that we, we had there. Who were your instructors back then? The instructors were well, Joe Kewart. Uh, Joe taught all the classes. Uh, Dick Giordano was one of our instructors. Dick Ayers. These are guys who, uh, if you know comics at all, these are really familiar names. Uh, Tex Blaisdell, longtime inker, was there. Erwin Hasen, who did a longtime newspaper strip called Dondi was there. Uh, Rick Estrada, High Eisman, uh, Ralph Reese, who's uh, about 20 years younger than every other instructor there that I had, but he was he was the teacher in my, my first year. When I went, it was only a two-year program. It's then turned into, into a three-year program. Uh, some of these guys came from the world of comic books. Others came from the world of newspaper strips, and others were from, like I say, other commercial art areas. Steve, were the, when you went, were they the same instructors, or were there more or less? Uh, a, a few of the, the same names. A, a lot of the folks Ron mentioned were gone by then, either gone from the school or just just gone. Uh, Joe Kubert in the second and third year, he wasn't teaching nearly as much as he was in, in Ron's day. Jose Delbo was a really important force uh, for, for first year students. This wonderful Argentinian hard ass, a, a great cartoonist, a terrific draftsman, and uh, a uh, just a force of nature. Ben Ruiz, Benito Ruiz, was our anatomy teacher. He was amazing. Uh, everyone who had Ben as a teacher does a first-class professional imitation of Ben. I don't want you to put your name at the bottom of the drawing. You are not signing your drawing. You're putting it at the top because this is an assignment you are giving to me in your classroom. You are not artists. You have nothing to express yourself. You have nothing to express. You are first year students. The only thing you have to express is your own ignorance. <laughs> I agree with all of that 100%. <laughs> I, I think, God, I love that man. He was my rabbi. He was beautiful. Yeah. Tex Blaisdell was there, who, who taught as much uh, by anecdote as he did by, by pedagogy. It was, it was all just, just stories about how, yeah, yeah, how this person screwed him over or how um, you know, he managed to, you know, to sneak this past the deadline. It was um, a really good lesson in the practical realities of being a cartoonist as opposed to uh, the, the job of, of, of being at the drawing board. Hi Eisman was also there when, when I was there. Um, he, he just taught lettering, but he knew everything. And uh, I would frequently bring him assignments from other classes to critique as well as my stuff from his class, and he would do it great job just a really thorough critique uh george pratt was my teacher in the third year i wasn't i, I was not yeah it was he was great and i was not prepared to, to learn what he was teaching i remember wishing five years after the fact that i could have gone back and taken that class again and i would have learned so much more just as important as any of the instructors the uh, 
loved my classmates. I learned so much from you know, from from watching a dozen, two dozen other people trying to solve the same problems and seeing all the different ways they attack those problems. Everybody's out there you know, trying to learn stuff about about new cartoonists, new new illustrators, new artists, and so we're feeding each other information. It was that was a huge part of the learning experience. Let's see, I was class of what were we? Oh uh, six to oh nine, and when I went, it was. It was kind of weird because they were in a transitionary period. They uh, were remodeling the, the school there in downtown Dover. So like for the first year, we were in a warehouse, which I had just left uh, a state university to go to the school. And I was like, oh, my God, I've made a huge mistake. Because, I mean, you walk into a warehouse with drywall up to separate your classrooms. <laughs> it was <laughs> terrifying. Yeah, it was one of those where I was like, oh, my God. And then, you know, you walk in and it's just guys wearing comic book shirts, you know. I had actually some of the few, the same instructors that uh, Ron and Steve had. High Eisman, a very surly High Eisman, I might add, was still uh, t- still teaching. Uh, Joe was had become like the big boss. You had to work your way up through three years to get to him and he only taught narrative. That was like, you know... That was the boss level, the final, the final stage before you go off into the world as a young bird. We had the, we had the Cuber boys, so we had both Adam and Andy. So uh, Adam taught first year narrative, and then Andy taught second year narrative. So you got a Cuber pretty much every year. For the first year I was there teaching anatomy, we still had June Brigman. And she invented Power Pack for Marvel. Uh, she was a big Marvel artist back in the, like when Jim Lee and all those guys were coming up. We had some really, um, uh, Fernando Ruiz was there. He's still teaching. Um, he's a longtime Archie Comics guy. Darren Ock at the time was teaching there. He was a former uh, Marvel editor. He gave you a lot of like real world introspection about like, hey, yeah, you know, it's not just like what you see. Like there's, he really made it seem like it's a, it's a, it's a village, not just one person that makes, you know, a comic. Um, Ma- Michael Kreger, I, sh- I have to highlight Michael Kreger. Uh, he taught, I believe he taught a writing class. They were really trying to get a writing class going by the time I was in second year, third year. He was kind of jumpstarting that. Now that we're done name dropping all these rad people who are teaching you guys, let's talk about Joe. What he was like to be around, what you learned from him. I was just going to say, if he caught you reading a, reading a comic book, he'd come up behind you and go like, that stuff will rot your mind, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Joe was uh, as great as a man to me as he was as, as a cartoonist. He really, he, he really, to me, was a mentor and a role model for, for how to carry yourself, not only in the business, but sort of just as a guy. Uh, he was a real stand-up guy. Soft-spoken, but knew exactly what he was talking about. And it just he just had that quiet confidence you have when you're, on, when you're a master and you don't need to show it. The biggest gift he gave me, I think, was what Joe was the most passionate about in comic books was telling a story. Um, and while he had, you know, blinding technique, and as Ted said, just a brain jam full of more knowledge that and stuff that he'd forgotten, you know, that that I'll never learn. But but I think the thing that kept Joe sharp and involved in comic books for his entire life until his death was that he would just get his hands on a script and try to bring that thing to life on a page vividly and compellingly. And um, in working closely with him, because I got to do some short stories that Joe was the editor on, and I would get together with him at his house and go over my little thumbnails, my pencils, my letters, and my inks. And every step of the way, Joe would be pointing things out to me. And um, and it wasn't to show up and it wasn't to beat me up. There was never any sense it was personal. It's like, you know, here's what you've done on this story, Ron, and here's about four other solutions for that, for that particular composition or the way you have rendered that thing. And these would all serve the story better. And was that leading the eye where you needed to go? That sort of stuff. And it was all about not, well, oh, this will make it a better drawing. Joe didn't give a shit about that stuff. It's like, this will help the story work better. That's really all he cared about. First and foremost, he was a mensch. I didn't have a lot of good role models like that growing up in my life. There weren't many people around me who I could look at and say, that's who I want to be when I grow up. Joe was one. He absolutely was one. He handled himself wonderfully as an artist, as a, as a businessman, as a family man, as a human being. And he did it all without ever making a big deal about any of it. Uh, it, was, it was something to see. And it, it, it's a personal example 
that, that I still go to constantly all the time. It, it's, it's, it's my, it's my WWJD. Uh, it, uh, it, as a teacher, he was wonderful. Uh, he, he knew his craft intimately. Uh, and years as, in, in addition to being a terrific artist, his years as an, as an editor had given him the communication skills to actually talk about the, the, the parts of art that can be kind of nebulous and, and hard to really pin down. Joe was able to. He was able to be incisive to tell you, to tell you what's not working and here's why it's not working or here's a, here is a way to solve it. It's not the way to solve it, but here's one possible solution. Like a lot of students who came up under him, uh, I had a few years where uh, I was mimicking his surface mannerisms, sure. and it wasn't. It was never something I sought out to do, but it was because uh, when when Joe would uh, critique drawings, he was very generous about put, laying tracing paper over things and showing. Here's what I would have done to make to make this thing that's not quite working more effective, and I'd see my nebulous stuff come to vivid life in Joe's line. And, oh, that's what I meant to do. Uh, it, it, it took me a while to, to shake off those surface mannerisms and apply the deeper lessons that, that, that he, was, he was sharing. You know, it, it, there's probably no individual that I don't share blood with that's had a bigger influence on me. Wow, it's, I'm getting teary-eyed the way you guys I, have talked about him. <laughs> I, I, need, I need to add something, because all, all that stuff that Ron and Steve just said I don't want to repeat because it, one, it was eloquently said, and two, it, it's all 100% true. Um, and I, the only thing I would want to add is that uh, the thing that Joe really instilled on me was that, you know, as a kid, everyone around me was looking forward to retirement. And then I met someone like Joe, and he was just looking forward to continue working. He was truly a <laughs> lifelong learner. When he was in his 80s, um, which is when I was at the Keeper School. I think he's early 80s, I think he was, somewhere around there. Um, he was learning Photoshop because he wanted to start coloring his own books. And I think if you read his last volume of Tor, he actually colored, I think, um, or at least helped out, assisted coloring um, a lot of those pages in the last couple issues. And that right there was like, you don't see that in anything. Most people like especially adults, you hit 55 or something and they're like, all right, I know everything I need to know, not Joe. And I think that's why a guy like him is so timeless because one, he was a lifelong learner. So he never got stuck in his ways. Um, and that's why his work, I think, in my opinion, kept progressing. You know, it, it's, it's one of those things where you look at that and I think as an artist, we, you kind of go, oh man, I, that's the goal right there is I want to still be is just as relevant as when I hit my high note when I break into the industry or whatever as uh, when I'm about, you know. I mean, he never exited. I mean, after he passed away, I think for the next two years, he still had books coming out, which was kind of crazy, you know? Yeah. When, when I was at school in the 80s, uh, this is 40-some years after Joe had, had, had started being a working full-time professional, um, there would be evening life drawing sessions uh, this, this wasn't a class. This was just an extracurricular thing held to school like seven or eight o'clock at night. Um, and I would go in to, to get, get some extra practice drawing from the model and Joe would be there, not as the teacher, yeah. just just sitting there with, with a, a stack of cardboard and cheap paper, magic markers, a thing of white gesso, you know, uh, just humbly recording observations from the model like any other artist, seeing what, 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 the model could teach him. And for someone to do that, he, he had all the laurels in the world to rest on. And that, that, that wasn't how he was wired. He wanted to just keep learning more. So what was the class structure like? What classes were offered at the Joe Kubert School? Yeah, let me see if I can remember. There was one called uh, Methods and Materials where you were introduced to, I mean, a lot of us had come there. And when I went there, it was like the end of the 70s. So no internet, <laughs> uh, no schools anywhere in the country that taught anything about comics or cartooning, nothing like that. The Cubit School is pretty much unique. So I was from Oregon. I didn't even know, you know, what end of the brush you, stip in, you dip into the inkwell to make a line on paper. Methods and materials is just, you know, these are the sort of erasers you should use. <clears throat> 
don't use that kind of brush. That's only for watercolor. These are the few brushes that are high quality and can give you a good line with inking, that sort of stuff. Um, there was basic drawing classes, um, composition classes, classes in lettering, uh, all across the board. Uh, the a big a big mentality, the idea that. You were at that school to learn comics soup to nuts, the, the entire process. Uh, we even had a, a class where we were taught how to do the old primitive method of color separation. So you would cut out these sections of ruby lift and you put it down on sheets of acetate for the different, the different three colors and the different three values of those three colors. So you, to color a comic book page is an incredible amount of labor. And it wasn't that they were expecting that any of us were going to wind up doing that. Possibly we would, but you didn't know. But the, the idea was, and what we were told is, even if you never professionally color a page in your life like this, you will know what that job is. So that when you're doing the earlier steps in the process, you will know what a headache you are making for the person working down the line on this book. This is before there were, before people had personal computers. So, you know, uh, when I was there, there were no Photoshop classes, nothing like that. But uh, everything about how to, how to make it work on a comic page, we had classes in it. Please. Steve, how did the curriculum differ when you got went there? Pretty similar. Um, it was pretty similar to, to when Ron was there. The, th this was actually uh, a, a, d a deficit that, that the school had in that uh, I, I graduated from the school in 1990 or finished the school in 1990, uh, having never sat behind a computer. Uh, so while, while I also did the Ruby Lith exercise, in a couple of years, nobody was going to be doing that. So we were, we were being prepared to, for, for a process that didn't exist anymore. Uh, they, were, they were a little behind the, the times on that. Um, but the overwhelming majority of what I learned was, was all just solid principle stuff. Uh, I think in general, they were, the, the school tried to teach a full commercial arts curriculum as well as, as comics. Uh, and it was, uh, it was great at what it specialized in teaching comics. It wasn't as good at teaching uh, how to be in the in the commercial art world because that's a very fast changing world, and the school wasn't set up to pivot like that. Tad, when you went, did they have digital art classes? Uh, well, that was a big problem. No, they did not. It was uh, they were trying to implement it, and they had one guy who was actually he was very. Thank God we had him, Gabe Bridwell, because if we wouldn't have had him in third year, um, I don't think, I think Tamara Bonvillian would have been the only person that, that would have been employable because she was the only one that was already just doing <laughs> like flats and for other colorists at the time. Um, but we had, uh, I mean, I don't think we even did di or like digital lettering until third year. And that was during our digital coloring class. So Gabe taught us pretty much. We had like one, like what, two classes a week where he would try and, okay, here's everything that's going on in the industry right now. The problem was, is we still had kind of the same okay. curriculum that like Ron and Steve were talking about. Like they even had my first year, they had an animation program and it wasn't digital. They were still, oh, wow. every, everything was paper and they had, they actually had like this, like, I don't know, this old VHS camera strapped to, one of those old machines, like animation machines that took the photos because they're like, oh, look, it's digital. And they would just, <laughs> sh sh sh. It, yeah, because I actually went to the Cuber school because I thought maybe I wanted to go more animation route because I was really into like Ren and Stimpy and that kind of stuff. And uh, then I got there and I was like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Not a place. Like by the time I was in third year, it was, they completely had redone the curriculum and first year, like part of their, like materials, like when I came in, all your materials were like T squares, animation paper, like everything that you would expect to see in like a 1970s Disney studio or something, right? Animation studio. And, um, and now it was like uh, the first year incoming kids were, they all had like state of the art laptops. Uh, they required you to like, you know, for your apartment or wherever you were staying to have a scanner so you could scan in physical pages, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So like they had, um, from what I understand now, now they have um, all like, uh, you know, must, not must, what's it called, Cintiqs and stuff. A few guys got the little, remember those little bamboo tablets? Oh, like that was yeah. state of the art. That's what people were using <laughs> to do digital coloring and digital drawing. Like I didn't even know that was a thing until I had the internship at uh, Helioscope. And that was like, oh, that's when I had that like kind of epiphany, like, 
oh shit, I'm 10 years behind everybody. I need to do something. I would say really Joe at that time was really trying to like hammer into if you want to be successful, you have to be used to, you have to be able to grind. Like it was more of like a boot camp. So maybe when you came out of school, you didn't have the strongest portfolio at the time, but you were definitely ready to take on way more work. And I think that even though I knew that I was a weaker artist coming out of the school than say if I had gone to maybe a school that allowed me the time to really fixate on doing individual illustrations and build a portfolio, you know, to get employed. Um, I wouldn't have been able to hit the deadlines for when I came out of school, even though I might not have, I had some stuff I had to learn still. I knew I could at least get stuff done if, if when I needed to get it done. What else were important things that you learned that stand out in your memory? Just to restate Tad's thing, the, 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 the how to tell the story, and that involves getting to the, the panel that says the end on it. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the school was very, it was, this is not a school that was based on theory and um, abstract concepts. This is, you know, and Joe and, and I mean, Steve and Ted have both talked about it, but it was, it was all practical solutions to get you to a good end result as quickly as possible, because we, you know, that was grounded into us. This is, this is not a place to, to be self-indulgent and worry on your own personal artistic journey and self-expression and that stuff. This is get the story told, get to that last panel and then move on to the next story. So that the practical aspect of it was, was really important. I learned professionalism and the difference between striking an artistic pose and actually saying something with a picture. I, I came into the school with a lot of very bad received ideas that came from reading art criticism and reading bi and reading worshipful biographies of artists as opposed to actually spending the time making pictures. Um, and the school did a great job of introducing me to the realities of, of, of working as, a, as an artist uh, and specifically as a commercial artist. I, I, I kind of thought of my time there as being like, I was the guy walking, walking through a snowball fight, wearing a big top hat. <laughs> <laughs> and I just desperately needed, uh, I didn't know it at the time, I needed somebody to throw, to, to throw an ice ball, right, and knock that thing off my head. And the school did it for me. Always be ready. Was that Ben? Did Ben throw the biggest snowball? That was snowball? Teachers, that my classmates. That was the experience of living in New Jersey for three years. It was, you know, back. Yes, Jersey, rough. I think now is the time that I'd love to just hear you guys reminisce, like talk about favorite memories and just like shoot the shit with each other. I got, I got a good memory. So, okay. So when I was in third year, right, every, everyone was terrified of Joe. I don't know why, but I think it was because he had his office and you only saw him for one class at this point. So, most of the students didn't really have a relationship with him. You only saw him that one day a week, you know? And then it was like, oh God, we got to get all of our stuff done on top of everything else because we're going to have him next week. And if our work's not done, my God, we're at the, this is his school. We have to at least complete his assignments, right? And um, so I remember everyone was afraid. I was a little intimidated around him. And uh, one day I, uh, I asked if I knocked on his door to get just just basically tear my stuff up and tell me how bad it is. Okay. That's what I was asking. For. <laughs> and he goes, Oh yeah, come on in. And I walk in, this is during the summertime. So it's not even during school hours. It's just during the summer. So I go into his office and he's eating this giant submarine sandwich. And I went, and I just immediately had that thing. Cause we looked at each other and there was just silence and we're looking <laughs> smiling. And I had that thing like, Oh, he's a mortal being just like everyone else. And after that, I had a very good, uh, I guess I want to say relationship where I could just talk to him like a normal person and he would talk to me like a normal person. It was, it was really kind of great because all the like, I just took all the steam out of the room. We're like, all right, well, because <laughs> you're just covered in like meat and mayonnaise and not to like, I, I you know, we're praising Joe. So I got to, you know, That's so yeah. funny. And he was like, I just sit down at the table and get like, he wasn't affected at all. He was just, give me a second, you know, like typical uh -huh. grandpa. Just kind of, it was great. It was great. And then he proceeded in just eviscerating everything that I'd worked on over the summer. Yeah. <laughs> a couple things that pop into my mind is, I don't know about when you guys went there, but when I went there, 
like I said, it was the end of the 70s, and some of my classmates were really centric human beings. And um, so I was in the second year. But the, so the first year students, they weren't, some of them were a year or two older than me, and but some of them would just seem, seem like they were light years ahead. They more worldly experience. I was a little kid from Portland, Oregon, and these were guys that had from big cities and had traveled around and had life experience and were pretty damn good on the yard. Uh, how old was I? 21? Okay. No. Um, but there were guys in the, in the year above me. The first year, the first year of the Cuban school had people like Steve Bissett, uh, Rick Veach, Thomas Yates. These were, you know, these were, and Yates was already a master. I mean, he was, he, he, he had, uh, he was so imbued with the spirit of Hal Foster and, uh, uh, he inflicted that on me too. But, um, there was a pool. There was a swimming pool at the Cubert School when I went there. Nowadays, with liability and stuff, they would have had to cement that sucker open. But it was open, you know. And one of those first-year students, a guy named Larry Locke, the first time I saw Larry, he was sitting cross-legged in a meditation pose at the bottom of the swimming pool. <laughs> that was the first time I saw Larry. And he was a – that says as much as you need to know about Larry. The one anecdote I can say that's the personal one for me was in my second year, one of our instructors was Robert Kaniger. Um, uh, he was a longtime veteran comics writer, had partnered with Joe on, on a lot of the Sergeant Rock and, and uh, NMA stuff that he'd done. And Kaniger, Kaniger was an accomplished comics writer and a fop. He was just... He was just very florid and colorful and squishy oh. and and arrogant. That's how we came across. Mm. You students are fools. You know nothing about the real world. You know nothing about art. You know nothing about story. And um, he would he, he used his lectures as a way to just sort of harangue us and make sure that we all knew that we were less than nothing. Oh. And uh, I had been uh, I had been a double major in art and English in college, and I'd read a few books. <laughs> and studied some literature. Um, and one time he was just going on about how we were all illiterate and couldn't read. And, and I was a very quiet kid at the school. I was very, you know, soft-spoken, kept to myself and just did my work. And I don't know where it came from, but I had enough of Bob Kaniger. Um, so after having sat there quietly and listened to it, I just, I just, I just said, bullshit at one point. <laughs> and he pointed to me and said, you, out of my class. Oh. And so I, I just got up and left the classroom. And a little bit later, I got, a, I got a note to go and see Joe. So I had to go in and sit there in Joe's office. And I thought, well, what's, you know, I'm gonna, he's going to bring out the wooden paddle or something. I didn't know what was going to happen. But he just said, I heard you said something in Bob's class today. I said, yeah. He said, you probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> And that was it. I mean, <laughs> they said, pat me on the shoulder and let me go. He knew who Bob Kaniger was. He was yeah. probably surprised that I was the one who happened to, you know, blow up. But uh, he, he, he knew what was going on. Joe was a very steady hand. As yeah, Steve says, a real mensch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, God, a, a lot of the stories involve setting things on fire. Let me think of it. Um, <laughs> what? But, um, the, in my first year, the animation class had the, had the room above the classroom I was in. And they had a, a stop motion animation doll. It was a, a fairly realistic, uh, oh, cool. uh, articulated human figure that they, they put a big schlong on and would, <laughs> would dangle it outside the window near one of my classmates and you know, make, make the schlong bang against the window. While <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> so he, he, when he knew it was coming, he, he opened the window up and he, and he got, um, a spray mount and a lighter and made a blowtorch and, <laughs> and, and set the thing on fire. <laughs> and so they, they, they brought the thing up and it was a, just a, a charred and smoking ruin. Uh, uh, another fire story. Um, uh, when I was living in the, uh, the Clinton house, which was, what, what, which was a, a residential house um, that the school owned that a lot of the first year students stayed in, um, two days a week, Tex Blaisdell, uh, one of our teachers, would, would stay there rather than driving back and forth from Connecticut where he lived. 
and he, he would stay in the basement. Tex is, uh, Tex at the time was about 72, 73. He looked 90. He was about six foot five. Just this, this huge looming presence with a giant light bulb shaped head and a deep <laughs> gravelly voice from years, years of smoking unfiltered cows. <laughs> and my, my classmates, or my, my housemates, I should say, somehow they, they trapped a gopher uh, or a ground dog, some, some, some rootling mammal about, about the, the, the size of a chihuahua. <laughs> um, and set it loose in the basement where uh, Tex was going to be sleeping. Uh, so yeah, I, I came into the kitchen around midnight and Tex was, was there smoking and he said, I'm not going down there until you assholes get rid of that fucking animal. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is it about the Cuber School that only employs artists that are either four feet tall, like Irwin, or um, seven feet tall, like Michael Craiger and Darren Ock? I, 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 no, I get it. It's either giants or the very, very short men. It's good cartooning, is why. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so uh, the, the 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 story of us trying to to get the the gopher out of the basement is is, is a long one. Uh, but I'll, 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 I'll skip forward to the fire part. Uh, we, we quartered the gopher in a, a, a wooden cubby hole. We didn't have any um, flashlights or anything to see in there. It was, a, it was a pretty dark basement and there was only one bulb pretty far away from where the thing was cornered. So one of us got the bright idea of that, that we, could, we could spot him and grab him using uh, oven mitts and various implements <laughs> by uh, sticking a roll of toilet paper on the end of a broom and setting it on fire, making a torch so we could get a, get a look. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're sticking the, the, the torch into the cubby hole where the gopher <sighs> is and we set some insulation on fire. <laughs> oh, <man>. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> So we, we ran and got got the fire extinguisher, and and and, and blasted it into, into the into the cubby hole, which is only about this deep. So it went in, and then it billowed out, <laughs> and and covered all and it put out the fire, but it covered all of us in, in the, the 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 powder, uh, and and we got a good look at the at, at the gopher that who just thought we were a bunch of assholes. <laughs> That was a, a, a fairly typical first year experience for us. <laughs> oh my god! How did you actually get the gopher out? Um, I had a catcher's mitt and uh, oven mitts, or I had, a, I had a catcher's mask and oven mitts on both hands, and I managed to just like like <laughs> up and shove him into a pillowcase. Oh wow! <laughs> That's pretty good. It's like a mafia story. <laughs> Took him outside and, and set him free, and he just ran right back up under the house. Did you guys ever get to see Joe get um, get editorial feedback on his no. own work? Oh my God, no! Oh, it was great. So I was—I don't know—it was like some. Joe, I asked Joe by the time I was in third year on the weekends. I asked him if I could come in on Saturdays and because so, at that time Muriel had had passed right the year before, and so Joe was coming in. He he came on Saturday and he would stay all day. And then, well, there's nobody saying he can't come on Sundays. So he was coming on Sundays too sometimes. Oh. And so I asked him, I was like, hey, you know, if you're here, if you mind if I come in and, and work just so I can just come in and work. And he was like, yep, fine. You know, uh, and I was there, I think it was like a Saturday night. Maybe it was a Friday. It could have been a Friday night. Anyways, it was late. It was probably like eight o'clock at night or something. And um, I hear all this like yelling back in his office. And uh and he comes pacing out in the room, right? Like out into, they have like the, the reception area, you know? And he gets on the phone with someone at DC and they're telling him that he has to make editorial changes to one of the characters in, at the time it was Tor, right? And they said that the lady was too like risque or something. I think she was topless or something. And uh, if, you t if anybody's re has looked at it, it's very tasteful. It's very well done, you know? It's like... Wait, yeah, anyways, 
Joe did not. Man, he was like, "What are you talking about? What are you talking about? It's it's not tasteful. Have you seen the stuff you guys are publishing?" And then, like, he finally gets off the phone and he's sitting there and he's doing the, he's got the, you can tell he's just stewing and he's way back. So I'm in the hallway in my little desk, terrified, trying not to be obviously listening to what's going on. And he's sitting back there in the dark with his feet up on the desk. And then I, he either calls Adam or Andy and he, and he just starts going off on them. You can just hear them on the phone going, uh huh. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I know, Dad. Uh, yeah, uh huh. And he's going, can you believe it? They're telling me that, uh, you know, like, oh, you know, she's hanging out there and everything, and it's too, uh, you know, people aren't going to like it. It's too dirty, blah, blah, blah. And he just started going on and on about just ripping into, like, you know, breaking backs. You know what I mean? Like in the 90s when they would twist the, break the lady's back to show the front and the backside at the same time, which is just mm -hmm. so absurd. And, yeah, it was just awesome watching him. Just He, he was just so pissed. <laughs> the only other time I saw him that angry was – one afternoon kids were throwing rocks there were some kids from across the street were throwing rocks at the school and they hit his window and he came charging out of his office dad they're throwing rocks at the building go get them i don't know why I'm making sense. <laughs> but it, but he made me run out the building and chase to see by the time i got out there the kids were already because he had like <laughs> had the window down and was screaming hey you kids yeah yeah he yeah and he, did you get them? I'm like, no, Joe, I didn't. I didn't they're gone. He's like, Ugh. Yeah. So Joe made, basically ordered me to go kill children. That's. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Do you guys want to say some last words? It was a great, uh, it was a great experience. It was a great experience for me anyway. Um, I always, I, I've often said, I don't think I learned anything at the Cuban school that I couldn't have learned on my own, but it would have taken a lot more years to, to do that. And uh, some of the friends that I made there, uh, as well as like Steve was saying, learning so much from some of these guys and getting to work with them on projects and stuff, um, are still some of my closest friends. So uh, uh, great years to look back on. Yeah, changed my life. There will never be anyone in the industry that's anywhere close to what Joe Kubert is or was. Ted, I'm wearing the shirt from your podcast. Yeah. Oh, nice. I was going to say, look at that. It's just like a Blue Tiger reunion up here. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Have you had Ron and Steve on your podcast yet? I have. Uh, I, except uh, when Steve was on, my computer just went, took a nosedive. And so I had to do it through my phone and my phone. So we got to have Steve back on because my, uh, my audio quality was pretty bad. Luckily, Bry saved the day. So oh, Bry sounded weird thing is all the details in all my stories will be different second time around. Okay. <laughs>